using the free TuneIn app. Once you do, search Rainier Avenue Radio. And remember, do not curse out your fellow drivers. This has been your Rainier Avenue Radio Traffic Update. And welcome to our live studio audience for another exciting edition of... Did you know? know? And here we go with round one. Did Did you know? know? No! COVID vaccine is free and easy to get. You don't need insurance or an appointment to get your vaccine. Vaccines are available at three locations near you. And now we're going to double the value. Did you know? The COVID-19 vaccine is always free of cost. You can visit pharmacies, community health centers, and other health providers in your neighborhood. And now for the lightning round. Did you know? The Delta variant of COVID is a mutation that has health experts worried because it's twice as contagious. Then for our finale, did you know? The best way to protect yourself from the COVID Delta variant is to get fully vaccinated. Get your vaccine today. Find out more at kingcounty.gov backslash vaccine. Did you know? We got the feeling now. Uh, yeah. R&B, soul, funk, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. We give you all that and more on Star Time. Join me, Paul Pearson, for a two-hour trip through the history of R&B. A new episode every week on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Come and get the feeling on Star Time on Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Hi, I'm Mac McGregor, the host of the You Can Make a Difference show, which airs live every Friday at 12 noon PT time. On the You Can Make a Difference show, we shine a spotlight on people who are doing amazing things to make a positive difference in our communities and in our world. We talk about what inspired them to do the work and what inspires them to keep going, how they got their start, and how you can, if it inspires you, plug into their work. We can all do something that makes a difference. So tune in every Friday at noon to the You Can Make a Difference show with Mac McGregor. High school football is back, but... Guess what? We need more referees. There is a constant need for qualified individuals to work our high school football game. Please consider becoming a football official. Go to PNFOA.com to sign up today. That's PNFOA.com to sign up today. This is a message brought to you by Rainier Avenue Radio. Your home for Metro High School football. Would you like to see when your favorite Rainer Avenue Radio show comes on? Check out our show schedule, updated weekly at RainerAvenueRadio.world. You're listening to Heartbeat Radio. I'm your host, Cindy Bright. Heartbeat Radio is a conversation aimed to take the pulse of corporate America. Opportunities for people of color, we're getting lost in the shuffle of change. I'm that provocateur of change. The hearts of corporate America are addressed access and opportunities will be accelerated for all people. Through Heartbeat Radio, you will gain a deeper understanding of what is necessary for change. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio this evening. We have such a great show planned for uh, you this evening. Um, Excited to bring forward three more candidates of color. Um, I I thought that was my FaceTime ringing. It must be somebody else's. Uh, Three candidates running. We have in the first half of the show, we have, oh, it was my FaceTime. We have, sorry about that. Um, We have Brandy Donahue from Snohomish County. I don't know if I pronounced her name right, so we'll have her on here in just a second. Uh, Before I bring her on, let's bring Joy Stanford on, who's doing the show with me again tonight. Hey, Joy. Hey! Hey, that's a start that's different from how I saw you yesterday on the FaceTime. <laughs> <laughs> how are you this evening? <laughs> yes, I do look a little different than I have for the last <laughs> five weeks. So let's bring fun. on Brandy. I'm excited to have her yes, on. Yes, I've never met her. Yes, Brandy. Hey! Oh God, yeah, that looks <laughs> we all have different hair tonight. How are you this evening? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm good. Pronounce your last name for me to make sure I know it. Donaghy. Donaghy. Okay, got it. Brandy Donaghy. Yes. Yeah. Snohomish yeah. County. We don't bring on a lot of candidates from your neck of the woods, so we're excited to have you on to hear what's happening in Snohomish County. So let's just hear about you. This is an opportunity for you to uh, talk to us about yourself and your campaign and what's going on up in your county. And I'll just remind you, you're among sisters here, so you yep. can be comfortable to talk to us about what's going on. Well, um, 
start off with, hi, my name is Brandy Donaghy and I'm running for Snohomish County Council in District 5, uh, which is how I answer my phone now. Um, so Snohomish County is a little different than King, King County, and I think that really shows um, with our elections. We have a, uh, a pretty... We have been seeing a lot of increase in diversity, but there hasn't been a whole lot up until recently, I think, um, or at least not people who look more like me. Um, and so that is kind of an interesting place to be. And we actually moved up here from King County, which uh, was an interesting change. But Snohomish County is the third largest county. It is one of the faster growing counties. As we grow, we see incredible diversity. And as our diversity increases, what we aren't seeing is a whole lot of diversity increasing in our leadership. Mm. And that's a problem because as of now, there has not been a black woman elected to a county council in Washington state ever. Mm. Um, there are a few of us running this year. I, I fully intend to be the first one. I'm hoping that I'll actually end up being one of the first because it would be really cool if we just swept it, right? It would. It would. Um, so it, it's just, it's it's kind of an interesting experience to do this, but it's also really important. Um, and I'm running not actually because nobody has done it before, but because we need to change the way we're looking at things. We keep creating these situations where we are um, causing problems that we'll deal with down the line and we're not dealing with them. And there's this tendency to expect everybody to come to leadership, to ask for what they want, instead of taking the time to go out to communities and talk to people and find out what they need. And so um, it, it definitely is an interesting space to be in. And it's an interesting experience to be a black candidate in this type of space. <laughs> We're talking to two pioneers because last week we got no. called pioneers. So you're talking to two pioneers who understand what you're talking about. I know you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, full disclosure, I do know Joy. So <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Cindy's used to it now. Yeah. Um, are you are you an emerge sister too? Why, yes, I am. <laughs> I I should receive an honorary graduation um, <laughs> certificate or something from Emerge because I have just been bringing on Emerge sisters left and right without even knowing is not my intention. I'm literally just trying to highlight and bring in brown and black voices of people who are running across the state of Washington. So not just um, and so it's nice to have somebody who's outside of the King County. Pierce County, you know, yeah. broader than that. Um, so we can hear what's happening in these other counties too. And so it's no surprise about the lack of diversity. I mean, Joy ran in Gig Harbor, I ran in Bellevue. Yeah. And so we are we are very accustomed to um, um, those ecosystems. Yeah, that so are the, not yeah. 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 Yes. And so you're running on, um, you know, your platform is about COVID relief. Uh, community resilience and housing security. Uh, talk to us. I'm really curious about the community resilience piece. What are you thinking about in that space? I have, um, I really, really enjoy working on things surrounding emergency preparedness and disaster relief. Okay. One of the things that's been quite clear over time is that the communities that tend to bounce back the slowest or that don't bounce back at all tend to be communities of color mm -hmm. and communities of immigrants. Given this, um, I work, I, I've done some work volunteering with um, local chapters of national relief organization um, in part to be able to focus on communities that weren't always getting that um, getting what they needed in order to be able to be resilient, to bounce back when there is a disaster. Yeah, yeah. And from a, from a standpoint of a disaster, you know, it's about making sure you've got the supplies you need, you're prepared for an emergency, you've got the information that you need in order to be able 
to get where you need to go to take care of yourself until things are resolved and help arrives. But the truth is that it's also a model for just stronger communities, right? So to me, making sure that we have the right resources in the right places at the right times in order for communities to be able to build up internal strength. Like we have community, right? We see a lot of diverse communities where people support one another. Right. They're there for each other. We're very, we can be very, um, we can be among friends and among sisters and, and, and such, and that is community. But we don't always have the resources we need to actually be able to survive in those situations. And so a big piece of what I'm looking at is making sure that when we create policy, we're doing so in a way that gets the right resources to the right spaces so that if we have another disaster, we are able to be self-sufficient within that disaster. And it's not just some dude sitting over there on his pile of supplies, the only one who has anything. He's sitting up there with a gun, right? That's that's not what we're going to see. But it's also um, if there is a job loss or a fire or a death or, or any of those things that can knock us on our feet and make it so hard for us to get back up again, we can build communities that are strong enough to withstand that so that we bend, we don't break. And if we do that, we're actually going to have a lot happier, healthy, more productive, and just stronger communities overall. It, it means we can decrease the need to um, involve law enforcement, right? Because if everybody has what they need, we have less of an issue. It, it means that we can um, avoid situations in which uh, people don't have access to the health care they need. Because if we have those things in place in the spaces that we need it, people who need it can get to it. The biggest trick, I think, is making sure that we actually are going to those communities because I can't decide what somebody who's living on a farm is going to need, you know, to get through a, a rough winter, right? Just like, I don't know, our current county council might not be in the best position to determine what a community of black and brown folk need in order to be able to get through that same rough winter. And so what's your population, your diverse population there in some yeah. that's good. That's good. <laughs> Okay, so I think with the most recent census we did bump up a little on black, which was about two and a half percent or so. Mm -hmm. So like really, really small. We have a fairly significant um Latin uh Latin Latinx community. Um, mm -hmm. I think Spanish is the second most spoken language here. Um, we have a good number of Asian and South Asian families. Um, we did see a lot of growth in diversity with the new census. I can't give you the exact numbers, but um, we still have like the county council is entirely white. And, the, and what impact, one of the things you have on your platform is about COVID relief. Yes. What impact has happened in Snohomish County, both to the county, uh, to your school system, to your kids? Like what's kind of the, the picture of what, what has been the impact in Snohomish County? And maybe same different, you know, King County is really focused on a lot of the housing issues. Seattle has the huge homelessness issue. What are the major issues there in Snohomish County? that Housing, you <clears throat> housing is absolutely an issue there. It, that was going to be my question. Housing yeah. is we do not have enough, period. Right. Um, we do have a lot of developers coming in, building lots of expensive homes, and people are buying them. But we just we just don't have um, the amount of affordable housing we need. We have probably over a thousand people who are sleeping on the streets every night. We have nowhere near enough beds for for everybody that needs them. We don't. We also don't have the services that they need for um, uh, healthcare or um, mental health care or um, addiction services and such. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have some pretty um, severe infrastructure issues because there are, I was in a town today doorbelling and my phone didn't work the entire time I was there because they don't have service. Um, there are- what do, you, what do you mean they don't have service? They, they don't, don't, they don't have like, they, they don't have the, uh, the cell broadband. 
Well, a lot of areas don't have broadband too, or no access to broadband, broadband is really difficult. And you had no areas. cell service in those areas. No cell service in some of the areas. Um, and so when COVID hit and schools closed down, they sent a lot of kids home and they would send them home sometimes with a Chromebook and with sometimes yeah. a hotspot, the hotspot might not work. Yeah. Um, and it created a situation where, you know, the kids in the, the kids in the more populated areas tended to have better access, although there were still clear issues based on um, socioeconomic positions. But um, for some areas, it was almost impossible for kids to get that education. They were being left out of it. And we also have traffic issues. Mm -hmm. And I know there are plenty of traffic issues in, in the Seattle and King County area. One of the things, though, is that we have a lot of um, we have a lot of bridges and we have a lot of uh, roads that go through or by hills and mountains. So there's that landslide threat. So if we had a um, an earthquake, there are a lot of communities that would be cut off for weeks entirely. Um, are your are your kids back in school physically right now? My daughter is 25. So oh. she's, she's doing her thing. My son is actually 12. He just is old enough for the vaccine, but he's high risk. So he's actually not able to return to school in person until he's been fully vaccinated. So how does that work? So is he, is he on hybrid? I think that's where Cindy was going so, with that. Uh, yeah. Or is he school, online school? He's online school. Our school does have an online academy or school system, but it filled up. And had a waiting list of something like a couple hundred people or families, from what I understand. Um, so he would be back in in-person school. But he also has autism and selective mutism, and he doesn't necessarily handle being in a regular school situation. Um, or a, not a regular school situation, a hybrid school situation very well. So like doing his work on Zoom doesn't work real well for him. And I am super, super fortunate and privileged to be in a position where I can actually advocate for him so he gets what he needs because a lot of kids with special needs were not getting what they needed. And a, a lot of a lot of parents didn't have the ability, the time or the resources to advocate for their kids. So tell me why you ran. Tell me what's your why behind running? Uh you want the short answer or the long answer? Short answer. I got fed up. Yeah, it got to a, okay, fine, I'll do it <laughs> moment when there, uh, you know, when we have these conversations on racial justice with leadership and it's a Zoom conversation with a whole bunch of people going on. I've been here for 30 years and I haven't seen any racism. Well, I've been here for this long and I haven't seen any racism. Oh, you think you've seen racism? You probably mistook something else for racism. How is your? Um, you wrote about that in your book, Cindy. <laughs> how is um, your council in terms of partisan representation? What does that look like? Right now, we have three Democrats, two Republicans. And um, are you are you challenging a Republican incumbent? Okay. Yes, I am. Okay, I am. He is um, the the man that I am challenging is actually very very one of his. One of his major um, policy positions is about um, public safety. Huge, huge fan of law enforcement oh. and the sheriff. Do you have SROs in your school district? Some school districts do, some don't. Um, the school district my son in is in does, but like Edmonds doesn't and other ones are having the conversation. Right, um, right. It's, it's an issue. Yeah. And depending on why they're there, heck yeah, that's an issue. Hmm? Um, what do you want people to know about your campaign? One of the biggest things that I want to make sure people know about the campaign is that it is a uphill climb. I fully intend to win, but I am literally climbing a mountain in order to make it happen. And I can use all the help that I can get. How so? Be, break that down a couple of levels for us. What what are you challenged with? Oh, well, money is always a challenge. My um, my opponent, I think, has about not quite three times what I do. 
mean, he started with something because he is the incumbent, but um, that is significant. And that does have an impact, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I have a tendency to disagree with the idea that we need lots of money in order to run for office. I think we should find ways to make it so that people who don't have money are better able to run because there are some amazing leaders who just haven't had the opportunity because whatever is going on in their lives makes it difficult for them to be able to, and that needs to change. Do you, do you guys have a voucher program up there? No. No? no. Okay. So then no. money is a big deal because yeah. from the candidates who ran here, raising money is hell. So for mm -hmm. our listeners to pay attention to, and um, Brandy, you are backed by the local Democrats. Yeah. Um, so um, are they helping, fun, you know, funnel or get people? I mean, we offered this to you so that we could get you seen and heard so that we can get people to, you know, donate to your campaign and recognize uh, that you don't have to actually, you don't have to live in Snohomish County to donate to Brandy. Right. Right. You can donate online. I think we had her website up here just a few minutes ago, but mm -hmm. um, any of our listeners um, and any of our elected officials who are listening to this, um, we need money put into her campaign to help her. Anybody who's running against white male Republicans uh, know that this is not an easy feat to do. And um, if he's got three times the money, uh, that makes your hill um, higher. So um we're grateful to put this out there and see if yeah. we can get some money in your campaign for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. The, the other thing that though I really, really helps is actually bodies. Um, having people help with doorbell when ballots drop, having people's help sign wave, having people write postcards. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me tell you, Brandy, a couple things. One is, um, I had somebody today, Christy uh, Bear is part of the Postcards for Brandy campaign. So she did message me and tell me that they have a, uh, a lot going on to um, help get you um, elected um, through the campaigns. And so we're uh, glad that we have some people behind you. Um, I guess apparently to Vampire Hunter who won't put his photo on his uh, message, I'd love to see your face. If you'd like to come on and talk with me live, we're happy to talk about it. But um, he makes some comments about it. it's never about money. It's always about money, never about people. That is white Republican thinking. Um, yeah. Anybody who knows that to win a campaign, you have to raise money uh, yes. to, to win a campaign. And the only time money is criticized is when it's going in black people's hands, not yes. white men's hands. And so, um, you know, keep it moving, Vampire. We are going to continue to help her uh, get some money into her campaign and make sure we can help uh, get these uh, Republicans unseated. So, yes. Yeah, it, it is an unfortunate situation. It's frustrating because it there is so much more we could do if we didn't have to worry about the money part of things. Yeah. And especially in a really geographically diverse area. Mm -hmm. We have farms, we have mountains, we have rivers. I have 110,000 voters. Um, and I just drove to the, I drove to the farthest city without traffic. I did that today without traffic. It was um, just, a, just over an hour. Yeah. Wow. So. What city was that Brandy? Index. That's in your that's in your district that you have to. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so I, I spent the day doorbelling an index. It was actually a lot of fun. I got to meet some really cool people. Nice. Um, who were, are really supportive, but you know, I think you know, getting out there takes money. It takes time. Yeah. I had to hire a campaign manager because this is too big of a campaign to do. Online. Yeah, we get that. We have um, one of our listeners asking who is helping with the postcards uh, to Joslandi, Joslan, who's asking to help. Um, the It's Washington Indivisible. And so Indivisible is a politically active group here. Um, and the person who I know who is on that, her name is Christy with a Y, Christy Bear. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Rosalind, if you want to send me an email at cindy at cindybright.com, I'm happy to forward it to Christy for you so we can get more support behind uh, Brandy to get postcards out. And then for any of our listeners who want to actually uh, doorbell and campaign with you, uh, that's why we do the show is to help. So, yes. yes. All welcome. 
Um, Chris is also going through postcards for Washington. Yeah, that's what it is. Postcards number four, Washington. And they have a couple other candidates that they're also working. To yeah, work they to. do a lot of postcards. And then yeah. they, some of us even do postcards. So um, I did 280 last year. See, that's good. I, just got, them, I think 90 of them were for you. Oh, thanks. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> I better get some for you. I just got 50 for Tracy Flood. And so I need to get cool. some for you. Absolutely. Um, let's send it out to those places that you can't get to, to doorbell and to um, knock, knock doors um, and to talk to those people. But it is exciting to hear that you're going to the farthest reaches of your district yeah. to knock doors because my question would be, is your um, opponent doing the same thing? Because um, that really does make the difference if you can talk to people in those areas, especially those rural areas. I mean, I don't know how much of your district is rural, so maybe that's a great question for you. Do you understand how much of your district is rural right at this point? A good chunk. Um, it's, it's a really odd district because we have a whole bunch of farms. Okay. Um, a couple small cities. And then you end up kind of in the foothills. Right. So. Um, and I don't think people understand that you cannot, you can't take a day to go doorbell in those rural areas because one farm's door that you're knocking oh, on could be oh a mile God. and a half or more mm -hmm. to the next door that you would go knock on. Yeah. So and often there are gates and fences. So you can't, get you can't even get in. You yeah. can't even get in. Yeah. And that's, um, a, big that's a big problem. Yeah. Well, one of the things we do is we take this show and then we push it into your area, into the Snohomish County, into your political group so that they can see you. This is a way to cover a lot of doors through a video here, which is why we offer this to uh, mm -hmm. unrepresented candidates to help you get your word out. So we're glad that you came on and we do have a team of people behind us that make this all work. So, And, and it, I really appreciate it too. I'm trying to, I, I have to do the doorbelling, I have to do the fundraising, but one of the things that I'm really trying to focus on is also connecting with people in all of the areas to make sure that I'm fully understanding the their issues and what they need. Um, and you know, having support makes it so that I have the ability to do that because people don't think about those rural areas and the people, nope. because, you know, why waste time on people who um, can't swing the boat? But mm -hmm. that's what it's about. It's about the people. It's about making sure that we are doing the best by our communities and building strong, resilient communities and really making sure that things are better for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're running. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is why you are running to do exactly, exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we're glad uh, that we're able to bring you on and help you with this, Brandy. Um, it does take a, you know, they say it takes a village, but it takes way more than our village to get things mm -hmm. moving. You know, we have, Absolutely. we as Brown and Black community have movement. Uh, happening right now because yeah. many people are stepping up and stepping into this political space that I think many of us weren't paying attention to for yeah. a long time. And, you know, as I said to people when I ran, which was in 2018, um, I had never even thought of politics. Like uh, to me, it was just this grotesque system and actually it still is. Um, but Joy and I met during that uh, election uh, time and got to see firsthand and experience everything that you talk about. Joy had supported the Democrats. I did not. I well, ran against another Democrat. So which we didn't know until the yeah. campaign was over because I certainly didn't know that. Yeah. Was like, I have supported them now, so they see what I'm out here doing is to help game change this. So it takes a myriad of different ways. Mm -hmm. Look, we are grateful uh, that you came on today. Uh, let's put her website back up before we go to commercial uh, so that people know how to get onto her website and mm -hmm. donate for her. Um, thank you, Gwen, for uh, posting that. Brandyforcouncil.com. Uh, Brandy, I know I will personally uh, go in and make a donation for you tomorrow on your campaign to see if we can help you out a little bit. Um, and we were, are happy that you came on and talked with our community. So thank you for spending time with us today. We are rooting you on um, yeah. to our community. Um, thank you for listening to Brandy. Um, she is just on the first half. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to bring on uh, two of the Bellevue 
uh, school board candidates on the second half. So we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Have that up your sacks. I'm Love you. I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo. 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 Friends of Waterfront Seattle presents Pier Sounds, an October concert series at Pier 62 on the downtown Seattle waterfront. Featuring sensational regional bands and artists, including Vaughn Lewis and Friends on October 9th. These free, family-friendly concerts welcome everyone to come and enjoy live music and the sights and sounds of Seattle's waterfront. Pier 62 was home to one of the most iconic and popular music events in the city, Summer Nights on the Pier. Pier Sounds Concert Series forges this memory with new energy and music on a revitalized Pier 62 to reignite the sense of celebration and community in the place where it all began. Pier Sounds new concert series at Pier 62. Visit Pier Sound. Hello, listener. What's important to you about what's going on in your community? Are you interested? Are you concerned? In any case, I invite you to tune into my show, Seattle Here and Now, on Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Why? I will be covering a wide range of topics important to you and impacting the community. Each show will have a special guest or guests to share with you information on a variety of subjects that are happening here and now in Seattle. I promise I will work hard to make my show informative, interesting, and entertaining. Be sure to listen to Seattle Here and Now on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. There is no secret why Downbeat Magazine calls this Seattle's most important annual jazz event. The 33rd annual Earshot Jazz Festival hits Seattle stages October with one-of-a-kind live jazz performances and video live streams all the way through November 7th. This year's Earshot Jazz Festival features the established masters like Diane Reed, Tuco Valdez, D. Daniel, and Red Hot Young Stars like Theo Croker, Emmanuel Wilkins, and Samara Joy. Celebrating both Seattle's history and its future in the world of jazz, Earshot teams up with community partners like Langston, the Royal Road, and Rainier Avenue Radio to showcase Seattle's own resident artists. Tickets and more information are available online at Earshot. Dot org as earshot.org once again Seattle's most important annual jazz event I Earshot Jazz Festival hitting stages early October all the way through November 7th call for more information would you like to see when your favorite Rainer Avenue radio show comes on check out our show schedule updated weekly at RainerAvenueRadio.world that up the sacks I favor black businesses assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black yeah uh huh, yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio this evening. I am your host, Cindy Bright. We had a great first half. Uh, let's bring Joy Stanford back in with me, uh, talking with Brandy Donaghy from Snohomish County. So I'm glad we could help give her a lift for her campaign, too. It's exciting to see all these new people. It is. Uh, for, yeah. For the second half of the show, man, I'm excited about this one because this is my hometown. So we have two. I should, well, it's my my city. I should say we have two Bellevue school board candidates uh, that are running for uh, the school board. Uh, both women of color um, that are doing some uh, amazing things and speaking out about some amazing things. And there's a lot going on in the Bellevue school system right now. Uh, so let's welcome in both Jane Aris and Joyce Shuey. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio, ladies. <laughs> hey there. How are Hello you? There. <laughs> so excited to have you two. So excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah, we want to hear what is going on in the Bellevue School District and who are you both and why are you running for that school board? Jane, you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, uh, my name is Jane Aris and I'm running for Bellevue School Board of uh, Position 5. Um, I'm running for this position because I've actually had a very large community reach out to me during this past COVID year asking me to step up and help heal our community uh, because of all the damage it's, uh, we've gone through be between COVID and social unrest and, and bring the focus back um, to our kids, you know, the center where it should be. And so um, I said, okay, here I am. I'll do the work. 
um, this is where my passion is, uh, education for each and every child, and it's always been. So I've been involved in our school district for 19 years and lived in Bellevue for 25. So I'm just continuing on the work here. Awesome, Joyce. So Jane, thank you so much, Cindy and Joy, for having us here. I am running because I um, have four kids and they occupied my time for quite a while, but the youngest is now 12. And um, the convergence of that um, freeing up of my time somewhat that they're older with a really, really um, difficult and challenging year in a year and a half in the Bellevue School District made me feel like I would like to bring, you know, more civility and more unity and um, healing, like Jane said, back into the community, because it's been a really divisive time and I, it doesn't need to be. We're in this together and Bellevue has a mm -hmm. history of, and the Bellevue School District being inclusive and welcoming of each and every student. And we need to make sure that we honor that principle. So here I am. Well, what is the uh, divisiveness in the Bellevue School District? Because there is quite a bit of stuff going on there. How would the both of you describe what is happening there? Okay, I guess I'll start. Why don't you say <laughs> something? <laughs> don't, let the, don't let us just take what the media says. You tell us. Yeah, well, let me say that I do think it's an extension of the 2016 to 2020 um, years, which were extraordinarily difficult for so many people, especially for BIPOC, because it was an, it was a time when people were finally seeing it from the perspective, I think, that many of us have just lived in our lives. And so while on the other hand, one hand, it was really a difficult four years, it was also an opportunity that Finally, other people were seeing it, um, but I think because it became such a, um, you know, people had to face it head on. Some people got more entrenched and, you know, other people, um, I'll include myself, felt like we had an audience finally that people could hear the different perspectives. Um, and then we were just continuing um, to, you know, ride out the aftermath, let's call it, of those years. And, and I, I feel like we have an opportunity if people really get back to basics and understand what, you know, happened between 2016 and 2020, that we can, you know, we can, we can heal the community. Because I do believe that people in Bellevue have great hearts, are inclusive by nature, and we can get back to it if people just, you know, take a step back, take a deep breath and talk to each other. What position are you running for, Joyce? Oh, I'm running for position number three. Okay. I was just looking at the website. So. Bellevue School District position three. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Jane, Jane, what's your take on the what's going on in Bellevue School District? Well, I, as Joyce have said, we do have a, a pretty amazing community that has been um, pretty focused on our education. We've been able to provide um, as a larger community. But one of the things I think we have come to an acknowledgement is that as much as we would like to make sure every child was thriving, we realized we we're missing. There were parts of, uh, of our community, of our students that were not fully succeeding. And in 2018, we as a school district pushed forward an equity policy. Well, that stirred up some emotions. And um, I think there's some good challenging going on right now. People don't, you know, quite understand what that means. And so they're afraid of it. And so we definitely need to do more education around what that, what does that really mean for our community? Um, and are, you so, speaking you know, about, are you speaking about uh, decolonizing public education? Yes. Well, <laughs> it's, we actually have the equity, we would put out a, policy, which is called equity policy, which is a lens that we are using to look at every element of our education system to make sure that we are truly addressing the need of each and every child, as we said in our vision and mission statement. And it's a great tool because it's making us come back and really analyze every aspect from curriculum to um, our everyday uh, function to our teacher hiring. I mean, we have, uh, I believe right now, we're about 48, 49% diverse in our school. That's good. That's good. I mean, I'm sorry, not 40, 69. Let me oh. stay here. 69. Mm -hmm. It's 
Um, so we are 31% white. Students. Six, yeah, students. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, you know, it's a minority majority student body. And so we need to do a better job to make sure that we're really representing our students. We are really addressing all the needs. We are really making sure that our students have uh, people who look like them mm -hmm. in front of them. All these things add up. Mm -hmm. And the equity policy is basically saying, we need to do a better job. Let's address these things. And who are you, you both, who are your opponents in your race? Joyce, who are you challenging? Uh, we, I am the incumbent decided not to run. And the person who is going to the um, general election along with me is somebody named Faye Young. And is she the, con the person that uh, made the controversial statements about uh, black children and their ability to think deep or something along that line? Yeah, and I would say controversial is charitable. <laughs> um, um, it, yeah, as I said, and she said black and Hispanic, I believe. I'm trying to find it. Yeah. <laughs> and Jane, who are you? Uh, which seat are you running for? Who are you challenging? Um, I am running mm -hmm. uh, in for position five against uh, my opponent is Greg Smith. What can you tell us about him? Him as a school board person. Well, um, I would say we are polar opposite as far as our um, position. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the equity policy. I believe that we should be really addressing the needs of all the diverse community and acknowledging that our diversity is a good thing and that we celebrate it and that we acknowledge the needs that comes with it based upon our history. Um, and so uh, it, we were, you know, I would say I have more experience working with our youth. Um, I have been an advocate for re really lifting all the children in our community. In the 19 years I have worked on various different committees, really challenging some of the uh, structural uh, issues, including, um, I, gosh, this is years ago when we had Dr. Uh, Mills as our uh, superintendent. Um, when I sat on a, a committee during that time, I asked him, why is there, why don't we have representation in teacher body that looks like our students? Because that at that point, I took a year to substitute across our school district. And kids who were diverse were excited to see someone who was not white. I mean, they were like, are you a teacher? Are you going to be my teacher? And, you know, just walking through the campus and that excitement made me go, why is it me, the substitute teacher? Exactly. The only color here. And so I went back and said, what is holding our district from hiring more teachers that represent our students? And you have a different lens, Jane, because you were a special ed teacher too. So you you come at this totally different than than other folks, I think. You know, yes. um, having that lens, and now that I hear you're a substitute teacher, tell me tell me how you're going to incorporate that lens um, with your 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 platform. Well, you know, I think um, you know I've I've had actually a lot of different perspectives. So, you know, I'm a English language learner, and I was actually adopted as an older child. And so I understand what it also means to be um, an immigrant and uh, learning English as an older person um, coming into a new culture. I also understand what it, it means to live with a family that was economically challenged and right. wondering where the next meal is gonna come from. I, I, I get that. I also understand what it is to be on the privileged side because I was adopted into a family that was, well, before to adopt me. <laughs> And um, as well as, you know, I have kids who are biracial and I, between that and my kids run all across the, the different elements of our education system from, you know, being um, in the special ed to general ed to highly capable. I've, I've actually worn all different hats from, parent to teacher to advocate. So I've been in all those seats. So actually, and being in that classroom, also knowing what works and doesn't work, allows me to ask those pertinent questions that 
may not be asked, not because of the current board members don't want to ask it. It's just that I've had that experience, which they don't. It's what you don't know, you don't know. And so you don't know how to ask that question. Whereas I do, and I can breathe that. Joyce, what can you tell us about, you know, you had mentioned when you were starting off uh, that you are very interested in mending strained relationships. And am I correct? Is the Bellevue School Board looking for a new superintendent right now also? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. And so talk to us about your views about how, and I, maybe let me just give it a little bit more color, pardon the pun there, but um, <laughs> we need color. when I hear, uh, you know, women of color speak um, and, or when the, uh, when white America hears women of color speak, there can tend to be a visceral reaction to us when we talk about um, needing students to see people that look like us. They have uh, become so colonized in how they view every fabric of society that they don't even understand that the same thing that has worked for their children by their children being able to see uh, people that look like them, so are um, brown and black people looking for um, educators and leadership that looks like us and who have an understanding of that. Talk to us about how, um, you know, the reaction in Bell Bellevue is strong uh, from my perspective because it has been very, you know, white dominated for so long and Asian Americans are now the dominant uh, culture or constituents now in the city. And so there's going to be a fight for power. When you talk about mending relationships and encompass with the fact that there's a new superintendent coming in. What can, what can you talk to the community about in that regard? I think that that is the most important job ahead for the board of directors. And as it turns out, it's, um, you know, that's an extra reason that I'm really glad that I did decide to run because this next superintendent will set the tone for you know, an, another generation of kids and then also for the community. And when you talk about um, people of color in particular, I think that, you know, I'll try to say this delicately, but, you know, but I, uh, white people take for granted that ease with which they can go talk to a teacher, that they can call the school board, that they feel like they can have safety in talking to somebody. What I would like to make sure we bring is to the students in the schools. And it starts at a really early age where you take cues from, oh, the teacher's going to potentially hear that person more. And if you've got a superintendent, let's take what I would like to see. If you've got a superintendent who listens, who listens to each and every student and each and every uh, family, then that will just, you know, continue that. I talk about spiral down. There's also spiral up. So if we are able to get a superintendent, which I'm confident we will, who takes into account that, then people will feel safe in schools. People will yeah. feel safe in the community and contribute those ideas. And once we have that better participation, um, because right now, we do have limited participation because people are too busy, because people have two or three jobs, and we need better participation. And if they don't feel safe, then it gets even worse. So we need to create a, a, um, an environment of safety. Do you have, does anybody have a sense here or an update on where we are in the selection process for that superintendent? Their interim is the one who just left us. Who is that? <laughs> Mark Jarvis. That's your oh. interim, right? Joyce and Jane, that's your interim? That's right. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. Um, one, of our, one of our listeners just asked, in an area that is really expensive to live in, here we go, um, yeah, and most teachers commute far distances, how do we retain BIPOC teachers or bring them in? Um, as you noted, the area really needed BIPOC teachers and leaders. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't even know what the diversity of teachers are in the Bellevue School District. Do either of you have a sense on that? It is much smaller than the student population. And one of the issues is when we talk about structural um, issues, because historically the positions have not been as accessible to BIPOC, the uh, more seasoned, experienced teachers um, tend to be 
more white and then the more junior teachers or the ones with um, fewer teaching years in Bellevue have have started to move towards being more BIPOC. But when you talk about layoffs, for example, and that's one of those structural things, it right. sounds neutral to say, OK, we're going to um, make sure we take care of. And that's important. The more experienced and teachers who have dedicated more service. But right. there is that impact on the, you know, the, comp the racial composition. So Jocelyn, thank you for that excellent question um, uh, on making sure that we can, and it's, you know, all our, our teachers, I will say when you ask the question about percentage, I understand it's only 30% of our teachers who live in district and yes. that. Yeah, that's, that's gonna become an a even more interesting dynamic for the Bellevue school system, given that Amazon's moving into Bellevue. Uh, yes. And so the housing market is gonna get worse yes. even more. Because your teachers are gonna make less than the Amazon workers yeah. at the Amazon building. How is that even right that they cannot afford to live in the town in which they teach? Hell, I well, can't afford to live there. Yeah, the, the reality is, is that, you know, it's one of the things I've noticed is that I doorbelled. Um, I've run into our, uh, the few of those people who work in our school district within our community. And the those people who live in our school district are people who've been living here for a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. they bit, they're, also, they're seasoned veteran teachers who also make more money than the beginning teachers. Yeah. And so they're set now. We and uh, I think the entry level housing in Bellevue is a million dollars now. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There is no way we could get any of our teachers to live anywhere close to Bellevue at this point. And we, you know, and this is where I think it's really important that the school district, school board members work with the city council members to come up with better solutions to create more affordable housing, not just for the teachers, but to service people at yeah, that's right. March. That's you, guys right. are, you guys are gonna be interested in my show next week because my show next week uh, is totally about um, education for black kids. And I've got some phenomenal guests coming on to talk about work that they're doing and programs, including uh, uh, the leader of Rooted, the Rooted School up in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, so we've got some people coming in to talk about this very issue and some of the different things that they're trying to do to help us to try to solve for these problems. And so um, we're glad we have uh, two candidates like the both of you that are running to get your voice um, at the school board level. Um, and let's hope you don't get eaten alive the way many of the other uh, school board members or people in that system <laughs> who've been trying to change it um, have experienced. So. Well, yeah, we I mean, need, what, happens, what happens if both of you are elected? I mean, that's huge to me. You know, as a woman of color, I'm thinking that's huge. We've got two, um, what I'm assuming are Asian American women who are ready to just take the lead and and bring about some great equity and empathy and real progressive ideas and push it and work with and partner with your own city council. And it's just, it'll be phenomenal if the both of you get over that finish line. Woo -woo. <laughs> Very excited. We definitely yes. community support. I I think we've gotten to where we ha have because of community mm -hmm. support, but the next several weeks is going to be really critical. So thank you, Joy, for allowing that segue to- no. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, I just see, I could see like, I can see change happening in both your brains like we got to do this because we got to make this happen you know well, i can see i can see jane by my fire pit to two o'clock in the morning again <laughs> <laughs> yes jane actually ran i met jane when she ran last time and we i remember we had because this is right after i ran too and so we had a great conversation about um what is necessary for change. So I'm glad to see you're back in the equation. Joyce, we're happy to have you running as well. Like it's a big deal for women to step up. It's a bigger deal for women of color to step into a very gross race. What can we've got a little over five minutes left. I wanna make sure people know uh, from the both of you, we know all campaigns need money. So that uh, clearly we, uh, we've been showing your campaigns. What other things do you want our community to know about you to vote for you, um, 
put that out there. Um, and if you guys could each do that in a couple minutes each, that would be great. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I, um, I think that the thing that I would like for the uh, audience members and the community to know best is that um, equity, equity um, is not at the expense of anybody. Equity lifts everybody. And so what I would love is for people to get my name out there and let people know that, you know, equity is not a bad word. It's a great, stupendous word that is good for everybody because it means each and every student. Um, as I often use with the, I was active in the uh, disabilities rights movement um, years ago and ADA and those people who might have at the time said, no, we don't need this. We don't want there to be those, you know, the ramps and all that stuff. A lot of those folks 30 years later are aging into a situation where it's benefiting them, right? So we, we never know where we're going to be. And if we can just get the word out there that if you've got a reasonable person, which you do in me and you see you in Jane, who is hardworking and who thinks about everybody, that it doesn't come at the expense of anybody. It's to the benefit of all. And what's your website, Joyce? www.joyceshuey.com. Thank you. <laughs> Jane. Well, let's see. What if, gosh, uh, you know, when you, any time you're told to do a stump speech and tell everything and to put this little oh, tiny thing, it's like, you should, should be a pro by now. now. You should be a pro by now. You got to be a pro. Got to be a pro. Well, you know, here's the thing. And it really comes to bringing focus back to the kids. And it's focused back to every child. And I can't put enough emphasis on every child, no matter what your ability or disability, your strengths, the weaknesses, or whatever race or color or economic background, we need to support every single one of them. And we can, there is no reason why we can't. We just need to be positive, work together, come to the table, put our differences aside and really, address the need because when we address every child's needs through our K-12 system, we set up for a better future for everyone. Yeah. And reality, we even get to maybe pay less tax because everybody's functional. And that is what we need to do. We need to create a healthy environment for all of our kids so they could all thrive and be successful. And that is my end goal, pure and simple. Why do yes. we have to explain it so much that the advantage of equity is everybody? Why are we constantly having to say that? Why, you know, you know, I'm being a little bit of a smart ass. There's a shocker there. But why is it that when we fight for equity and we want to have all children represented, that we have to explain and walk delicately about yourselves as candidates for office. You both deserve to be in office now. The student body of Bellevue area is predominantly Asian American and it should be a given that we have leadership like you representing these students on the school board. So, you know, I'm just amplifying what you say. I know you guys are being really nice. It's exhausting that we as women of color have to constantly say those type of things to diffuse perceptions that it's either or. It is not the Asian students versus the white students. Yeah. It is the Asian students and the black students and the white students and everybody that gets right. It's all. Yeah. Right. That's what your that's what your message is and that's what you're looking out for. And thank you, for Cindy, for saying that, because it is true that we are constantly fighting that. I think that there it comes from a place that there's a national movement behind it, right, to demonize that word. And we just keep, you know, keep at it and we'll That's get right. there. And you guys need to. And we want you to. That's why you're here. We want you to keep at it. We want you to get across that finish line. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank we you do. so much. Yeah, so look to our community who is listening to Bellevue residents who are paying attention because I know a lot of you are because I saw a lot of people like that we had these two ladies on with us this uh, this evening. Um, we can go to their campaign pa pages that we've shown you and donate to their campaigns. Uh, the voters pamphlet should be out here pretty soon. I think I my sons came out this past week. So it's 11 days, 12 days, 14 yeah. days, something like that. 
Yes, to um, vote for these two women. Thank you both for coming on tonight yes. and talking about your platform and allowing us to highlight you and amplify you. We will be pushing this into the political groups across the state. We're doing it as the show is live. So thank uh, the both of you. To our listeners, you will want to pay attention next week because we have quite a lineup of uh, Black leadership coming on to the show next week, and we are focusing strictly right. on uh, what I'm going to say globally strong is Washington ready. Are we are we graduating our kids? Uh, are we paying attention to our kids in the school system? So thank you both for being on tonight. Yes. Thank, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, to the community. Have a good evening. We will see you live next week. Bye bye. See you next week. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Black businesses. Black. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo. Yo, yo.